because we're Gate Mila Falchek in session Olish Media Shot, Egg Flask on Nagalve. Hello, you're all very welcome to this information session on Creative Europe at the Galway Film Fla, uh, a different Galway Film Fla and a different Galway Film Fair to other years. We're joining you on, online uh, for a digital version of both the festival and the media supported market that started this morning. So there's been a lot of uncertainty this year with COVID-19, um, which has affected production uh, and all other industries. Um, but what's also changing for us in Creative Europe is that this program <coughs> is ending at the end of 2020. And negotiations are underway for a new program. And to give us an idea of what's happening both with uh, plans for a new Creative Europe but also dealing with uh, the audiovisual industry in a post-pandemic world. We are delighted to have our keynote speaker from Brussels, Martin Dawson, who is Deputy uh, Head of the Media Unit in DG Connect in Brussels. So Mila Falcha, you're very welcome, Martin, and thank you for joining us today. And over to you for your keynote address. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you. Um, although I, one day I would like to come in uh, person, physically. But as you said, this is a very special time. It is not a, a normal year. It is definitely not uh, business as usual. And you asked me to talk about uh, the plans for Creative Europe and also the uh, response to the, the COVID crisis. If you allow, I would uh, do it the other way around. I would first talk about the response to the COVID crisis and put the plans for a Creative Europe um, in that context, because indeed uh, we have been uh, scrambling and working hard to uh, respond to the COVID crisis, as we all have, as, as you have, as the industry has. So, um, in fact, um, the culture and creative sectors of which uh, the film industry, TV industry, audiovisual is, is a core part, the culture and creative sectors as a whole have been amongst the hardest hit, together with the tourism sector. And our commissioner, Commissioner Breton, uh, is keenly aware of the scale of the challenge and uh, pushed us to take action in various ways. So the first thing we did, of course, was to reach out to the industry, to the stakeholders to understand uh, the, the problem, the, the scale and the type of problems, the, the needs. Uh, and we did uh, uh, to the European associations, to contacts with uh, direct contacts with the producers and distributors. And the commissioner himself uh, personally also had uh, a couple of meetings with chief executive officers from the audiovisual industries to uh, understand uh, at first uh, fa at first hand uh, these challenges. Um, and we quickly got the picture, uh, as you said, as is well known by now, uh, cinemas have been shut, um, shooting uh, new productions have been stopped, and sometimes festivals and markets have been postponed. Although I think you, the Galway Film uh, Festival with others. Uh, so I'm thinking also of the, a good example was the Danish Documentary Festival and in Copenhagen, the Cannes Film Festival itself uh, went online. And uh, of course we um, have supported that as much as possible. So the economic effects on the sector have been uh, huge, uh, both directly and indirectly broadcasters part of the ecosystem broadcasters have also suffered to a, a reduction in advertising estimated at an average of 50%. What could we do? Through the media program, we uh, took uh, three uh, steps. First of all, we implemented media in as flexible a way as possible through, uh, for example, postponing the deadlines for calls when this was feasible and for transferring uh, project activities online uh, when necessary. That was the first uh, step we took. The second step we took was to increase support to, to cinemas. 
we had some uh, budget uh, flexibility because the European Parliament had added uh, some funds and we were able to allocate an additional 5 million euro to support for the European cinema network. And the thinking behind that was twofold. Firstly, the cinemas have been amongst the hardest hit because they had zero revenues. And um, also because they, they are at the end of the value chain, by helping them, that would have a knock-on effect to other uh, parts of the industries, including distributors and producers. That was the second step. The third step we took, uh, and we are taking, is on the guarantee facility. If you remember, the guarantee facility is a market instrument financed through Creative Europe to support lending to SMEs. And uh, we have increased, we will, we are in the process of increasing the guarantee coverage there up to 90% for individual projects to maintain the level uh, of lending. Um, more broadly, more broadly, for the economy as a whole, the Commission recently uh, proposed a recovery plan. As uh, our Commissioner Breton has said, you know, we should try and make this crisis into an opportunity to really um, strengthen Europe's economy and key sectors. Um, because this crisis is more than just a bump in the road. It's really a kind of moment of truth when certain uh, issues have been revealed in the broad daylight. And overall, for the European economy as a whole, there is a need to, to strengthen our uh, autonomy and make sure we're not dependent on uh, outside uh, other, other third countries. Now, coming back to film and TV, the culture and creative sectors have been recognized as part of this unprecedented recovery plan uh, as one of the key areas, one of the key ecosystems. There are 14 ecosystems. One of them is culture and creative sectors and audiovisual and media, film and TV are of course at the heart of that. Uh, I won't go into the technicalities, but uh, this is a new, uh, brand new initiative, uh, next generation EU, it's uh, 750 billion euro made available uh, uh, by the European Commission on top of the usual budget uh, and it will be a mixture of, of grants and loans. It will be implemented by member states. It's important for you to be uh, informed about this uh, big picture because it will be implemented by member states through national uh, recovery plans if and when the Commission proposal for this recovery plan is adopted. And we hope the Council, uh, the Member States, will agree to that soon, still during this month. And that the, uh, this, these sums will be mobilised to finance concrete projects, which have been identified, uh, firstly to save the most fragile players, and then to strengthen the industrial ecosystems, so including film and TV, to address the major challenges of our time, which our President, uh, von der Leyen, Mrs. von der Leyen has underlined are firstly the digital shift and secondly greening and, and resilience. So overall, I know perhaps that's a lot of information, but overall the, the message here is that uh, this recovery plan represents a new opportunity for support at a time of crisis. And uh, it will be implemented through national plans of member states, but it's important that the culture and creative sectors, film and TV, are part of these plans. We as Commission, we will be part of the discussions if and when our proposal is adopted. And uh, we will be encouraging member states to give priority to strategic investments, strategic investments in audiovisual and media. So I thought I should start with that big picture. Now, uh, coming back down to uh, Creative Europe, Creative Europe will of course be part of this overall package. Uh, we, the Commission, made uh, the proposal for 
the future of the program, successor program, we made the proposal now two years ago in 2018, and negotiations were launched with the Member States and the European Parliament as usual. But as you know, unfortunately, not enough progress has been made yet. And in fact, uh, the negotiations uh, during 2020 did not make uh, progress. Um, so um, it will be it will be a challenge from a technical point of view to uh, implement the new program in 2021. Given, given these delays, but of course you can count on all our uh, determination to, to take it forward. But clearly it is not all in the hands of the European Commission. The important decisions need to be taken now at the political level in order to go forward. Now there are two big decisions. One is on the budget and the second one is on the, the legal basis, the, the regulation. So on the budget, um, in the light of the COVID crisis, the Commission has renewed, uh, revised its, its proposals. Mm. And uh, as regards to Creative Europe, the Commission is proposing an overall budget for the period 2021 to 2027 of 1.7 billion, 1.7 billion euro, which is an increase of about 15% uh, compared to the budget envelope for the previous period, which was 1.46 billion. The European Parliament uh, has been saying that this is not enough, uh, especially in the light of COVID. Uh, the European Parliament position is to double the budget. Uh, until, recently, until recently, the Council position of Member States was uh, to have something less than what the Commission proposed. But do we see that uh, in this unprecedented situation, uh, perhaps some uh, discussions are ongoing. For example, there was a letter recently by the Ministers of Culture of France, Germany and Italy saying that uh, they, they hope the Commission will increase its proposal or uh, review its own proposal upwards. So we shall see. But first, that decision on the budget is, is necessary. And of course, we all agree we should have a strong, a strong budget in this uh, context. Second decision that is necessary is the legal basis, the regulation. Uh, the European Parliament has decided uh, to put the negotiations on hold during the Croatian presidency. They were uh, asking the Commission to uh, change its proposals as regards the governance uh, of the programme, meaning that the European Parliament should have a greater say on the operational uh, work programmes uh, that are adopted every year with the, with the projects and the financing for the projects. But uh, of course our hands are tied as European Commission because uh, we have to have the same governance for all EU programmes. Uh, we cannot have sorry, generous uh, modalities for Creative Europe. Uh, we hope that the negotiations with the European Parliament will start again soon under the German presidency, in the, probably now after the, the summer break uh, in September. So where does this leave us? Uh, given this uh, delicate situation where, as of today, a stable legal basis is missing, the, the Commission cannot uh, officially adopt the work program 2021 or even put it on the table uh, formally. Of course, we have been technically preparing uh, and we are technically prepared, we are technically ready, but we cannot go forward with any um, formal steps. Firstly, because legally it's not possible. Secondly, because the negotiations are not finished. So there is some uncertainty about what we can do and how much we can do. Uh, we simply do not have that information. But we are keenly aware that any delay in the implementation of the future programme will ultimately hurt beneficiaries, unfortunately, which are already subject to great difficulties in the context of COVID. And this is a message we are sending to the European Parliament and to the Member States that we really now need 
these decisions. Having said all that, uh, we can uh, discuss in broad terms, and we are sharing in broad terms, uh, the ideas that uh, will underpin our proposal on the work programme 2021. We have had these discussions now for some time with stakeholders. So, uh, what would be the, the guiding principles behind the work programme 2021? So, there are four, four guiding principles. Firstly, to, overall, as we have always said since 2018, uh, no revolution, uh, this is more of an evolution, because we do need to change with the times. So, first of all, encourage more and more cross-border and cross-sector cooperation in order to make sure that we have the strongest impact at European level, the strongest European added value. So we do things that only we can do at European level. Secondly, um, cooperation and collaboration should involve as much as possible uh, players and companies from different parts of Europe uh, and representing also different capacities because we know uh, among, uh, between the 27 member states there are several uh, differences, significant differences in the size of their film and television industry and their capacities and we want to encourage all of them to participate and be included. Thirdly, reaching out to larger and younger audiences is also key. And for this, we need to uh, exploit promotion and distribution opportunities, including online. We need to catch the famous digital natives. And last and, uh, last and not least, as for the rest of the economy and society, we need also to make our contribution to greening, to ensure uh, sustainability, and inclusion, uh, including uh, gender balance. So those are the overall, let's say, guiding principles that we uh, will be uh, that will be guiding us in our work. And um, more concretely, to reach these uh, objectives, we believe the next program should be shaped around four clusters of actions. First cluster would be on creation of content. So from the development phase, which we will continue to be uh, supporting and we, which we agree is critical. Uh, we will want to focus on co-development with a view to strengthening co-productions. Uh, and we will also be uh, supporting high-end TV series as well as the growing sector of video games and immersive content. A second cluster would be around the business capacity of European companies and professionals, encompassing training and skills through uh, talent and skills, sorry, through training, enhancing access uh, to markets, and developing innovative tools and businesses. A third cluster would be focused on reaching audiences, in particular through networks of European cinemas, of festivals, of VOD services. We will continue to uh, support distribution of uh, individual films. This is the old selective uh, scheme. Um, we will support, uh, we uh, look to support more uh, subtitling and of course audience development and film education. That's the third cluster. The fourth cluster will be more policy related uh, and will accompany the implementation of the Directive on Audiovisual Media Services, uh, supporting Euro European regulators, for example and also uh, studies through the European Audiovisual Observatory. Well, uh, that's uh, as much as I wanted to say uh, as regards uh, folks of the media uh, sub-programme. Uh, I just wanted also to uh, say two words 
uh, uh, before I conclude, two words on the cross-sectoral aspect, because um, this is uh, an innovative part of the successor program, the future program. So cross-sectoral means in our jargon, uh, when uh, we have a project which brings together the audiovisual sector with other sectors, such as publishing, music, theater, in order to collaborate on common challenges, common opportunities, whether it's uh, reaching wider audiences or changing business models or using data. So there will be, uh, in our proposal, a creative innovation lab, which will finance these cross-sectoral projects, which we think have an enormous amount of potential uh, and are more relevant than ever today. That will be part of the work program of 21. And also for your, for your information, for your background information, another novelty in the future program will be that through the cross-sectoral strand, for the first time, Creative Europe will also be supporting news media, the news media, uh, actions to support media freedom, media pluralism, and media literacy. So there you are, in a nutshell, that's uh, where we are in our state of play and our, our thinking. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much, Martin, um, for that very comprehensive overview. Just a couple of questions before we bring in some of our beneficiaries. Um, so on the recovery program, is that likely to be in 2021 or is there any chance it, it will come into effect this year? Um, I think uh, personally that um, the recovery, uh, the new recovery instrument, which, was, uh, which will implement this uh, 750 billion euro, uh, or most of it, will be uh, on tap uh, as of 2021. Okay. But uh, I should add that um, next to that, or in advance of that, the Commission has already taken some uh, steps uh, through some horizontal uh, interventions. So, for example, as regards employment, there was the Shore program of 100 million uh, euro uh, to support furlough and short-time uh, employment. So some action has already been taken over the last couple of months. There was a revision of uh, state aid rules as well, for example. Uh, there was uh, an initiative to strengthen cohesion funds. Um, so th there are some things that are available as of 2020, as I've mentioned. But the recovery plan of 750 billion, I think that will be coming into uh, implementation next year. Thank you. And of course, we at the Creative Europe Desk media offices were always asked about when are the next deadlines, particularly for development, for slate funding, and so on. So obviously, there can't be any new deadlines until we have a new programme adopted. And I know it's difficult to answer, but in your best estimate, do you think that there will be delays? Because we usually have deadlines in November for the budget for the following year. So that's probably not likely to happen in 2020, would you say? Well, I think the, the normal calendar will not be, uh, is already not being uh, maintained uh, because normally we would already have had our program committee with the member states the, the work program for the next year would already be on the table would already be uh, as of today would be in the process of being adopted so yes everything is sliding towards the end of the year and uh, i think it is likely that there will be some uh, uh, delays in launching the call for proposals and we will have to uh, try and catch up the best uh, the best we can and to reduce any delays yeah okay thank you very much and we'll have uh, some opportunity for a question and answers towards the end of this session uh, but now we would like to bring in some of our west of ireland beneficiaries of creative europe to give you a sense martin of what's happening here in the west of ireland and how important the creative europe media monies are to the sector here in the West. 
So uh, if Ray can hear us, if he could uh, uh, ask all our panelists to join us, and if you could switch on your videos and microphones. So there you are. Right. Um, so we have uh, Kahalo Kuik, who's a Connemara based producer, but as you can see from where he's sitting, he's actually in situ in Spain. Uh, we've Liz Quinn from the Galway Film Fla, and we have Mo Honan, and we seem to have lost Niamh Fagan, who was with us previously. Oh, she's there. Yes, we have Niamh Fagan from Luna Pictures in Westport in Mayo. So I think we should start with our hosts for today, the Galway Film Fla. Uh, they have been in receipt of media monies for a market at the festival since 1996. Uh, but for the first time, the market at the Galway Film Fla, the Galway Film Fair, is being delivered digitally. And I think it started this morning, Liz, so maybe you can tell us more about that. It did, indeed. Uh, well, little did we know back uh, in March, in the March lockdown, that we'd be sitting here in front of our laptop on, on a Wednesday during the, the film fair. Uh, it's, it is quite something and it's been a, a, a very um, quick learning curve, I think, for everybody involved digitally. Um, the market kicked off this morning. We're very excited and delighted that we're able to host it online. Um, we, have, we have 573 meetings over three days and that's with 148 decision makers and producers. So we're running the market over three days now um, using a digital platform, B.Square, which is, which is amazing. And it's actually amazing that we are able to, to continue, you know, to replicate as much as we can the marketplace, when it, which in itself is pretty, you know, how can you replicate a physical marketplace? It's very, it's nigh on impossible, really. Um, the, the Goy Film Fair has always been about that intimacy, the atmosphere, the people that, the impromptu meetings that you might have in the corridor on your way to your, ne you know, so it's that kind of buzz, I think, that obviously won't be there digitally. Mind you, it might be there in the meeting rooms between the, the, the decision maker and the producer. But it, we felt it was just um, so important to have that continuity, to provide, as Martin was talking about, the support to the industry. I mean, it's a really important event in the film calendar in any case. And I know, and we have received just amazing goodwill from um, you know, decision makers, producers, distributors, friends of FLA and FAIR, and who are all delighted that you know, we're able to be present in this crazy time. And do you think that some of the, uh, this venture into digital will remain with us for the next edition of the film fair, which hopefully will happen in real life, but will some of us, will you bring some of the digital aspects with you for the next edition? There's been many aspects about going online which have been um, amazing that, that we have learned, you know, by not by choice, but we have learned and there's some incredible things. And absolutely, we will be taking a lot of that on board and bringing it forward. I mean, just even across time zones and perhaps, you know, participants that wouldn't be able to make it because of other commitments, but might have a couple of days for me, you know, so there are some um, fabulous um, advantages to it, but <laughs> Um, I don't think that you could ever replace that physical one-to-one, -one, um, you know, that, that, that is very, it is quite difficult. And we all know over the last couple of months how difficult it has been over Zoom and, you know, with these kind of online meetings and how, I mean, it's an incredible, incredible technology. But just to have that week in July where, you know, you get um, so many people from the industry together in Galway, in the west of Ireland, from across Europe and beyond, um, you know, connecting uh, is really important and I don't think will ever leave us, hopefully. And uh, Martin was mentioning uh, an increased focus on collaboration 
uh, for the next program. But this year they've also introduced a new scheme for festivals, um, mm -hmm. for festival networks. But you were ahead of the posse in Galway because you already had a network set up since 2017. But can you tell us a bit more about it? Yes, we were ahead of the posse. You're right. <laughs> we um, we had set up with um, in collaboration with Galway 2020. We had set up a network of festivals. The idea came from a project called Peripheral Visions, um, which is now a competition this year over the festival. We have 12 films from our network, but I'll talk about that now. One second. The network is made up of 12 festivals. Um, from across Europe, including Iceland, Finland, uh, Germany, France. Um, and they're all independent, you know, um, festivals with the same kind of mindset, I guess, who we've come together just as in a support network to share um, best practices, to share uh, a support system with each other on, a, you know, how each festival works and what kind of information uh, we can give each other. Um, and how we run our infrastructure. And it's been pretty amazing, I have to say. Um, we met firstly in 2017 and it's grown from there. We, we were going to have a big conference this year at the FLA, but obviously we can't do that. So we've been having lots of Zoom meetings and meeting up and exchanging ideas. And there's one festival already, Midnight Sun, that had gone online. And so it's an amazing way of just um, coming together, you know, and and sharing that information, sharing your experience. Um, and as I said, we're having a competition during the festival this year called Peripheral Visions. Each film festival has um, put forward a film uh, from their festival. And uh, we have a panel, a jury of uh, film societies from Galway who are um, going to judge it and the winner will receive 3,000 euro and it's just a great way to put everybody bring everybody together you know and and to share that European along with the help of Galway 2020 and all of our funders um, to have that uh, aspect in the fly and we're very proud of our network it's, it's great. Yeah so it's great that we have um, one event happening this week uh, as part of Galway 2020 European capsule of culture but of course a lot of their events have had to be cancelled or postponed so it's great to see one going ahead digitally so thank you very much Liz. So we're going to move on now to the animation sector and we have Mo Honan with us who runs an animation studio here in Galway. She's also industry chair of Animation Ireland so she can give us a perspective on how important the Creative Europe funds are for the animation sector but in particular for her own company, which has received uh, Slate funding in 2017. So over to you, Mo. Tell us hi. a bit, hi. A bit about you. your project. And hi to all of you here and to Martin and anyone listening. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's all a bit strange just listening to you all and thinking about what we've been through in the last few months. Um, I'm in Ardmore Studios in Bray, which is... Um, Ardmore Sound, I should say, which is part of the Ardmore Studios campus in Bray on the East Coast this week because we're doing the final mix of a sequel to a film we've been working very hard on called Two by Two, Overboard. Uh, original movie was called Two by Two, Oops, the Ark has gone. And this project and IP has been in my life actually since 2007. Um, and it would have been impossible to develop this and to get it into co-production with people all across Europe without media. There's no doubt about that. Um, media was uh, a contributor in the original development of the, of the movie and again in the sequel. Um, and really what it's allowed us to do and me to do um, with this project is build teams, build our crews, um, build our co-production networks for our slate now as well, for which we, we got uh, development money and that's crucial to building a company strategy as well as also uh, benefiting each individual project. Um, it's allowed us to skill people, to upskill people, um, the writers, the crew, and just listening to Martin there, I mean, we had probably up to 15 different nationalities on our co-production, you know, from all across Europe, 
if I if I think of everybody on, on the team in three countries um, over the last two years. Um, and we're finally in the final mix now. And in the last few months, of course, we've had to really recreate our workflows and how we're communicating with everybody. We're very used to co um, collaboration and co-producing an animation. It's what we do anyway, because we have to do that in order to get things made due to the financing uh, requirements and also the skill set requirements because it's quite a heavy demand across a whole project, the, the variety of skill sets that are needed. Um, so this has forced us even further down that route and, and some of that has been difficult. Um, I think for some people from the outside, uh, it looks like everything's easy for us. And, and, I, and I would say that we've been very resilient and that we've been able to continue working and anything that's already on our tables is certainly progressing. Um, what it doesn't show perhaps is maybe um, that we have had to, uh, you know, get accelerated into everybody remote working, set up everybody um, technically, invest more in software, um, redo uh, our approval and workflow process. And, and all of that slows us down perhaps, but it still meant that we could function and technology has been a real friend there. Um, and the other thing that we're concerned about, of course, is a little bit further down the line because really animation, if it's already in process, as I say, we can keep working, but down the line, our financing models and availability of financing, of course, will come to a head, I think, later in this story rather than up front. So that's something we're, we're keeping an eye on. But to, to just mention again, Evelyn, I mean, yes, the, the development money from media has been a huge um, player in, in our company and, and also in the, the film, the project itself. So thanks, Mo. Um, Martin mentioned there um, this new concept of more collaboration and co-development. Now, I, I think you have co-produced everything you have made, but could you give yeah. us your views on co-development? Um, yeah, I, I, I think there's, there's a couple of things here to consider. Um, First of all, there's the project itself and I guess the, the creative nature of the project and, and allowing the project to find its own voice. I think that's very, very crucial when you're developing. And if you are, have to consider co-developing too early in that journey, you're not really allowing that to happen, perhaps with the writer or creative producer or director or whatever way that team is constructed. You do need some development period where that's happening in an organic way with the core team before you start attaching other voices, other concerns, other um, partners who, who, who may need to drive it in another direction just to make it work for them. So I, I would just be cautious around that side of it. I do see the point because as I say, we, we collaborate all the time. I do see the value in, in, um, in co-development if it's put into a certain context and if it's not a forced marriage in that sense. You know, you can, you can get into it too soon and then suddenly you, you have a partner who wants to pull in another way or that you have to legally un, unhook from if you want to um, realize it's not working perhaps and seek a more, a better fit. So I, I would just feel there's caution that maybe needs to be exercised around the the requirements and how they might be built to co-develop. Okay, well, I think that's the start of what will be an interesting, interesting discussion going yeah. forward. I wish we had more time, but we uh, need to move on to our other panelists. So um, thank you very much, Mo, for your contribution. So we're moving on to Neve Fagan from Lunar Pictures. Um, she's even further north in the West. She's in Westport um, and she's had a great success last year with a documentary called Shooting the Mafia, which I think has sold everywhere in the world. Uh, but most recently on the last development deadline, she received support for a TV drama. So we'd like you, Neve, to focus a bit on how important it is to have creative Europe media development for a TV drama, uh, particularly um, an ambitious TV drama project such as your own. So over to you, Neve. Hi, how are you? Thanks, Evelyn. Hi, Martin. Hi to everyone else and everyone who's Hi. watching. 
uh, I think this is fantastic. I watched uh, the eighth last night and uh, the Q and A afterwards, which is a really good example of a uh, cross border collaboration between people living on the east coast, the west coast, America, Dublin, rural Ireland. I mean, so it happens all the time. This um, collaboration with people in different territories. I mean, the the film that I made, Shooting the Mafia, was a UK director, an Irish producer and production company, an Italian subject in an, in the Italian language. So it, it is doable. I mean, you know, everybody working together within Europe is doable. Um, so with the TV series, it's fiction uh, series for me. Um, I've made TV uh, in the past. I've made a couple of series for Tichi Kahar and a couple for RTE. They seemed such a long time ago now <laughs> and a lot of things have changed. So this is my very, this is my first um, grant that I've received from Creative Media. And I'm very excited about it because I think it really does. It's, it's a really um, strong professional endorsement um, in, in the project. And I think it helps funders take us a little bit more seriously. So I'm looking forward to, we're at the very early stage uh, of the journey. So I'm really looking forward to taking that further. Um, I think something that Martin said earlier, you know, that out of a crisis comes opportunity. I do think that we will have to possibly look at how we, the kind of stories we tell, certainly initially, and how we tell those stories. So we got good news last night that we got a, a, a small little commission from TG Cahar to make, um, some short films and a series of short films. And I look forward to doing that because they've been written with COVID in mind and we will shoot them with COVID in mind. So that's, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to that. That's kind of like really dipping our toe in. Um, and uh, I think for the West of Ireland, uh, media has been very important, as you can see with Mo and her company and Liz with Go Away Film Fla. I mean, really, it's been so supportive. Um, and Evelyn is, is always there on hand to help all of us through the, the uh, massive application. But I feel very proud that once, you know, your, your series or your idea or your project, be it a film or a series or animation, gets through the media rigors, uh, I think it's a good it, it's a good thumbs up really for other funders to kind of take a look at you and take a look at what you're doing a bit more seriously. Um, and I think being in the West of Ireland, uh, it's we've kind of always been and I don't know if the rest of you would, would agree, but we've we've used uh, Internet and email and telephones for a lot of what we do and have been for probably a number of years, as Liz was saying, that they were ahead of things on the, uh, with the festival grouping uh, online. So I think we're kind of used to it um, and uh, we will continue that way. Um, I feel like I made Shooting the Mafia from the side of the mountain, <laughs> looking, overlooking the beautiful Atlantic Ocean. So it wasn't a bad place to, to be making a film. Um, um, and I also feel like, you know, everybody wants to come to the West of Ireland to for their holidays. I don't see why they can't come. The audience, we can't bring the audiences to the West of Ireland for our stories. So I think that's my, here are my feelings on it. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, so our final contributor, um, Mila Falsha, Kahlo Kuig. Kahlo Kuig is a, a, a documentary producer and director. Uh, f with a company based in Connemara here in the real west of Ireland. Uh, but at the moment, he's in Sitges near Barcelona, uh, which explains the background there. Um, so, Cahal, if you could uh, receive some funding for a documentary called uh, Farewell to Music, Slán Leis an Gion. And um, he can tell us a little bit about how important the Creative Europe media funding was in the development of that project. And, some of the challenges, but also maybe from the perspective of somebody who's producing in a minority language and you know working and collaborating across Europe, if you could give us some idea if of the challenges involved with that. So Akahal. Right. Um, thanks for having me. Hello to everyone. Um, it was fantastic for me really to get the media funding. Um, it came right at the right time. Um, it was my first 
major project on my own and uh, the funding just allowed to do so many different things at, at development stage which wouldn't have happened um, test shooting to make an industry teaser um, to do archive research which all sounds quite easy but it takes money and it takes time and if if, uh, if you don't have support for that at an early stage it's it's a challenge um, the film I made was quite visually um, challenging or perhaps stylized and with the funding I was able to try out different things some things that didn't work so from a practical point of view it, it was fantastic um, but also on I guess on a European level it allowed me to to step outside my comfort zone and go to places like Docs in Thessaloniki, the ITF Academy, where I got to develop the project and perhaps more importantly, develop myself and develop the company too. So, you know, for, for producers starting out, um, if you manage to get um, this support, it's, it's, it's a really great opportunity. And even then inside some of the, um, the big events like the FM, of course, media have their own stall, they have their own circle, which allows you to, to organize meetings um, with, with sales agents, etc. And uh, uh, if you have the, um, like Nia mentioned before, if you have that kind of media logo, the, the brand, there's a brand value attached. So if you do go to, to meetings and you're kind of a first time producer and you're, you're reaching out and feeling very vulnerable, um, if you have that on your, on your paperwork, people take you more seriously. They know you've, you've done your homework and you must have something of some value here. Uh, and that, that means a lot when you're going into these things for the first time. Um, and, you know, luckily through that, I managed to, to make a sale to HRT in Croatia um, with my first project. So, so that, that was really wonderful. Um, to your second point with regards to Irish language, um, I guess working in a minority language is a challenge anywhere. You have, you know, limited speakers and a limited community um, that you're working with. But then if one is from that community, I think there's, there's, a, there's a flip side that you feel at least you imagine that you feel comfortable telling their stories or telling stories that are of interest to them. And I have to say in, in Ireland, we have, um, we have great supports, you know, we have, we have media, but we also have great broadcasters who are looking for Irish language content. Um, there are very friendly festivals such as Goy Film Fla and many festivals in the States, which are friendly, I would say, to Irish language films. And of course we have the BAI in Ireland, which is a huge support for Irish language filmmaking. And I guess, you know, it's something that's often said, but a good story transcends language. So if, if you can make a good story for your own community, it, it should um, it should travel well. Okay, so Gramaka the Cahal, thank you very much um, for that. Um, and I think we've kind of covered the spectrum of development there with animation, with TV drama, and uh, with documentary, and also experienced producers, and how important media is for people starting out as well, particularly when they're starting out looking for European co-producers and to collaborate. Uh, if you have some questions now, uh, please ask them in the chat. We have one here for Martin. Um, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. You mentioned that media has support programs for film festivals as well as subtitles. Could you please say a bit more about this? Um, so I think the current festival support is already there, but you could give us some uh, information on what you mentioned about support for subtitling. Yes, so on the, on the festivals, firstly, we will um, continue to support festivals that have such an important role in the, uh, in the ecosystem and uh, to promote films and to reach out to audiences um and uh, europe has so many wonderful festivals i'm thinking is that uh, we would like to strengthen collaboration between festivals uh as we've just heard uh, from liz that uh, already a number are collaborating uh, as of today uh, so it's, it's not a new uh, idea but we would like to strengthen that and we would like to structure it more and, and support it more because we think that uh, again at European level that's where we can um, that's where we can help so that uh, whilst preserving the identity the individual identity of each of each festival nonetheless they don't each have to reinvent the wheel they can support each other they can share best practices they can also develop some tools, for example, for uh, film literacy uh, projects. They can share data uh, uh, and develop some digital uh, 
presence and tools and initiatives. Uh, I think the COVID crisis has been uh, precisely a learning uh, experience for everybody in terms of the potential of digital and that, um, and that uh, more could be done in between, you know, because uh, 12 months in a year, uh, the festival will take place typically a week uh, in those 12 months. But uh, in between the physical event, there's so much that can be done also online. So that's uh, uh, something that we will be keen to uh, uh, take forward uh, in 2021. And on, on subtitling, well, uh, without going into technicalities, because uh, I can't, uh, given uh, uh, everything we said earlier, that we don't yet have uh, a stable basis for it, we cannot put our projects on the table. But you know, the thinking is simple. It's simple is that um, we, at European level, want to make uh, films travel as much as possible across borders and that still uh, there is a lot of uh, margin for, for progress there. And right? there's still um, the average film, uh, feature film uh, released in theatres uh, is distributed, I think, to two or three different countries in Europe. Whereas uh, the average American film is distributed, I think, to something like 10 different countries in Europe. So, which is, which is, of course, is a big paradox now, because we're playing at home and our films travel less than uh, films from across the uh, Atlantic Ocean. So, we know there are many historical reasons, et cetera, et cetera. But still, uh, I think we, as, a, as, a, as an industry, as, as Europeans, we should have the ambition of sharing our stories, whether they're from Galway, or from Spain or from Finland, uh, sharing our stories uh, with many more countries, many more fellow uh, neighbouring European uh, countries. One of the uh, one of the obstacles uh, is clearly language, and clearly uh, for smaller production films with smaller budgets, the costs linked to subtitling are not negligible. Obviously, for the Hollywood uh, studios. They can afford to uh, translate everything to Finnish or to Portuguese or to uh, Italian, but um, for a small film from Galway, perhaps it is less uh, less uh, easy to digest uh, that extra budget. So that's why we will be uh, boosting our support in that area. Thank you very much, Martin. I'm being told we have to wrap up. Uh, very soon now, but before we go, uh, we'd like to show a trailer of um, Mo's uh, film, which is in post-production, and we heard on the BBC all about the challenges for the composers uh, of the score. Um, so if we could show the, the clip, and before we do, just want to thank everyone, uh, particularly Martin, because we know you're an hour and ahead in Brussels, so sorry to use up your lunchtime for this event. Thank you very much no for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. An overview. And to Thank all you. our panelists for joining us and best of luck with the festival and with all your projects. So hopefully now we can play the clip of Oops, the adventure continues. hasn't been easy on the Ark. 147 days with no sign of land. What's this one? Same as yesterday. Ugh, and this one? It's a burned pot of that one. Mm. This is all the food we have left? Huh? I need to make this food go a long, long way. <laughs> Dave, uh. where are the kids? Land? Betty! You're awake. Good. You're a Nestrian. <laughs> Please stop poking me, dear. I built this colony to keep Nestrians safe. Wow. From meat-eating beasts. The Ark. It's landed. Oh, boy. Here we go. Shouldn't we help them? What do you think they'll be eating when the food runs out? Rocks? 
No, not rocks. You! You want us to go running into the jaws of your carnivorous friends? If our time on the Ark has taught us anything, it's... Never, ever get into a tickle fight with a hippo. No, Dave. It has taught us that it is possible for us animals to put our differences aside. Something's go wrong, but I can be fine. Yeah, we'll be just fine. the Ark to build a hot tub? No, we destroyed the Ark to build three hot tubs. Relax. Have a mocktail. 